In this interactive module, we will cover safe procedures for performing hot work in classified areas, in-service welding, and hot tapping. When we're finished, you should be able to identify those safe work procedures and the hazards involved with hot work in classified areas. You should also understand safety requirements for performing in-service welding and hot tapping. Let's start by defining hot work. Hot work is an operation that could be a source of ignition when performed in a potentially flammable or explosive environment. These environments are known as classified areas. Performing hot work in classified areas requires special procedures. Examples of hot work include welding, burning, grinding, blasting or opening energized electrical junction boxes. The use of open flame or non-intrinsically safe electrical tools and instruments are other examples of hot work. Generally, classified areas are where combustible concentrations of hydrocarbons or other flammable vapors may be released and accumulate. Typically, classified areas surround equipment which processes or contains hydrocarbons, storage tanks, wellheads, pipeline connections, and valves are all examples of such equipment. Determining if an area is classified is pretty straightforward. All areas within facility boundaries are considered classified unless designated otherwise, and the same is true for offshore platforms. When performing overhead work, areas within 50 feet of overhead power lines are defined as classified. These areas are kept classified to provide greater protection for workers from electrical shock, fire, and explosions. Overhead work includes operating cranes, winch trucks, or raising derricks. It also includes traveling with loads, equipment, and winch poles which exceed 15 feet above ground level. The dimensions of a classified area change depending on the type of work being done. When open flames are involved, classified areas extend 100 feet from facilities or equipment containing hydrocarbons. However, when the work involves using portable, spark-producing equipment, or when opening energized electrical panels or junction boxes, the classified area extends 20 feet from equipment or facilities containing hydrocarbons. This includes areas within 20 feet of vehicles that transport hydrocarbons, such as vacuum trucks, hot oil trucks, and fuel oil trucks or trailers. Examples of portable spark-producing equipment include electric power tools, heaters, and spark-ignited engines. The dimensions of a classified area change depending on the type of work being done. When open flames are involved, classified areas extend 100 feet from facilities or equipment containing hydrocarbons. However, the classified area extends only 10 feet from equipment or facilities containing hydrocarbons if you're using portable, spark-producing equipment or when opening energized electrical panels or junction boxes. This includes areas within 10 feet of vehicles that transport hydrocarbons, such as vacuum trucks, hot oil trucks, and fuel oil trucks or trailers. Examples of portable, spark-producing equipment include electric power tools, heaters, and spark-ignited engines. You must process a special permit before performing any of the tasks we just discussed in a classified area. The permit process exists because of the potential for explosion and fire in a classified area. A hot work permit may also be required in non-classified areas at the discretion of a supervisor, offshore operator, or other designated personnel. You must process a special permit before performing hot work in any classified area. A hot work permit is also required when trucks, graders, cranes, and other mobile equipment are parked within 10 feet of a classified area. 
A hot work permit may also be required in non-classified areas at the discretion of a supervisor, offshore operator, or other designated personnel. Let's continue now with a look at permits and responsibilities. Hot work permits are valid only for the specific area, time frame, type of job, and person doing the work. Permits can be closed out only under these conditions. When the job is complete, 12 hours have elapsed, when a shift changes, or an emergency condition occurs. When a permit expires or is canceled, a new permit must be processed before work can begin again. A closed out permit may not be reauthorized. Permits can be closed out only under the following conditions. When the job is complete, when a shift changes, or an emergency condition occurs. When a permit expires or is canceled, a new permit must be processed before work can begin again. A closed out permit may not be reauthorized. If site or operating conditions change, any person has the authority to stop the work and void the permit until the conditions are corrected. That includes all employees and contractors, no matter what their position. For more details about hot work permits, check your company's safety and health manual or handbook. Let's now look at the responsibilities of the various people involved in hot work. When the permit is not initiated by the supervisor, the initiator is responsible for completing the form. The initiator should coordinate the job with the supervisor or the designated alternate in charge of the facility. When the permit is not initiated by the supervisor, the construction engineer is responsible for completing the form and coordinating the job with the supervisor or the designated alternate in charge of the facility. Operating personnel must inspect the job site to ensure the proper conditions exist and that all equipment is prepared correctly before hot work begins. The inspection should cover areas at least 35 feet adjacent to the hot work site, including the distant side of walls or barriers where sparks or heat might spread. Operators must verify the condition and placement of fire extinguishers and other safety equipment. Personnel doing hot work should be told where the fire extinguishers are. The operator must also make sure those doing the hot work are familiar with the location and use of communications equipment. Before signing the permit, operating personnel must always complete an LEL, or Lower Explosive Limit, test. Under certain conditions, tests must also be performed for oxygen, hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and any other toxic gases or hazardous conditions that may exist. Be sure to perform the oxygen test first when working in a confined space or vessel to ensure the accuracy of the LEL reading. Unit operators must also ensure that lines to be demolished or removed are properly identified and marked. Designated or operating personnel must inspect the work area periodically and retest the atmosphere as the hot work progresses. If a change occurs that results in an unsafe condition, they must stop the work immediately. After the job is finished, operating personnel must inspect the area to make certain the work is complete and that the area is clean before equipment can be returned to service. Only then may the permit be signed off. Now let's take a look at what's expected of supervisors during hot work operations. The supervisor is responsible for the safety of personnel and equipment and must be satisfied that proper precautions for hot work have been taken. This would include ensuring that all people involved in processing the permit have fulfilled their responsibilities and that workers are fully qualified. Before the work begins, the supervisor should hold a pre-job safety meeting for all personnel working at the site. 
This includes those who will actually perform the work, the fire watch, and the workers who check for explosive or toxic conditions. People working in nearby areas that could affect job safety during hot work should also attend. The purpose of the pre-job safety meeting is to be sure that all personnel clearly understand the work to be performed and the conditions of the permit. The meeting is also to verify that production and process equipment are prepared and isolated and the area is ready for hot work. Established emergency response procedures should also be reviewed. The supervisor may appoint a designated alternate to perform his tasks, including examining and resolving any safety concerns so the permit can be approved and signed. The designated alternate may sign the permit in place of the supervisor, however, the supervisor is still ultimately responsible. Before beginning a job, everyone involved with the work, including contractors, must read and understand the conditions listed on the permit. They must also alert other workers to special precautions or conditions involved in the job. It's the supervisor's responsibility to make sure all these things are done. People doing the work must make every effort to keep sparks and slag at the work level. This includes confining sparks so none fall through pipe racks or grating. Workers must remain aware of conditions in the area and stop work when conditions change. If work stops because unsafe conditions develop, work must not resume without approval of the operating personnel. When the job is completed, or at the end of the shift, workers should clean up and secure the work area. Then return the permit to the supervisor, designated alternate, or main control room to close out the job. Hot work involving welding, Cutting or an open flame requires that someone be designated as fire watch. The fire watch must have no other assigned duties while on watch. They must be fully aware of the conditions listed on the permit and continually observe the area for safety and combustion hazards. The fire watch must notify the person doing the work if sparks are not contained in the immediate work area. They should also alert others entering the work area of hazards such as arc flashes, grinding, cutting, or overhead hazards. The fire watch must be trained to use available fire extinguishing equipment. They must also be familiar with the location and operation of alarm systems. If a small fire starts, the fire watch should sound the alarm for assistance first and then attempt to extinguish the fire. Finally, the fire watch must remain on the scene for at least 30 minutes after completion of hot work to make sure nothing ignites. The safety department representative is responsible for providing an independent assessment of the work area before any work begins involving hot work in a confined space or on in-service piping. Contractors have added responsibilities when contract welders are used. The contractor must maintain a permanent record of all welders used at a job site. This record must include the name, social security number, identifying mark, qualification record and date of last certification, and testing authority for each welder. In addition to duties covered by processing the permit, Several other functions must be performed before starting work. This includes properly preparing and isolating equipment as needed. Operating personnel must make provisions for locking and tagging equipment, installing blinds, or performing other isolation procedures. Cover drains and sewers in the area with a proper vapor barrier. Be sure all equipment is properly ventilated. Isolate the hot work area from other equipment by using fire-resistive tarps. Also, when scaffolding is used, ensure that it meets all requirements. The supervisor must check all welding and cutting equipment to make sure they've been inspected for cracks, splits, and loose connections in the welding leads. 
Leaks in oxygen or acetylene connections and leaks in hoses or valves must be repaired. Backflow valves and flashback arresters must be installed. Any damaged equipment may not be used. Grounding leads are to be placed as close as possible to the area being welded. This confines possible arcs to the immediate welding area and prevents arcing across bearings, seals, and so on. When welding at offshore installations, be sure welding devices have exhaust spark arresters, emergency shutdown devices, and drip pans. Shutdown devices must be independent of the normal fuel shutoff for the welding engine. These shutdown devices must also be in place when welding at onshore product loading terminals. Finally, if conditions require additional permits, be sure those permits are issued and the applicable special procedures are also followed. Work involving confined space entry is a good example. Before the work begins, the operator should hold a pre-job safety meeting for all personnel working at the site. This includes those who will actually perform the work, the fire watch, and the workers who check for explosive or toxic conditions. People working in nearby areas that could affect job safety during hot work should also attend. The purpose of the pre-job safety meeting is to ensure that everyone clearly understands the work to be performed and the conditions of the permit. The meeting also verifies that production and process equipment are prepared and isolated and the area is ready for hot work. Established emergency response procedures should also be reviewed. When work begins, the hard copy of the permit must be posted at the work site to inform or remind workers that hot work is in progress. The posted permit also allows anyone in the area to check the conditions that were present at the beginning of work. Again, while work is in progress, operating personnel must reinspect the area and retest the atmosphere as necessary. After the work is complete and the area is clean and secure, notify the control room or operator and return the permit to the main control room. That covers the procedures and responsibilities for hot work in classified areas. Remember to consult your company's safety handbook or safety and health manual for details on processing permits and additional procedures that may apply to your specific location. Let's turn now to in-service welding and hot tapping. These are not routine procedures. They're limited to essential changes made to pipes or equipment which must remain in service and cannot be blinded, disconnected, or purged. However, these procedures do not apply to pressure vessels. In-service welding and hot tapping procedures require strict precautions during preparation and execution. Ignoring these precautions could result in burn-through, injury, or creating a weld susceptible to failure. In-service welding is defined as welding on pipes or equipment that contain or are contaminated with hydrocarbons or other hazardous materials. Often this type of welding is performed while the pipe or equipment is pressurized, which means the operation requires special caution and planning. This includes pipes and equipment that have been hydro-tested with diesel. A separate permit is required for each in-service weld. This separate permit includes several specific items in addition to the normal hot work checks and inspections. First, operations or maintenance makes a written request to the proper engineering group for an in-service welding or hot tap assessment. In some locations, this may be done with a facility change request. The request includes engineering data such as line number, equipment specifications, type of product, pipe size, and wall thickness. In addition, the assessment request should include drawings showing location, size and position of saddles and connections, pressure, temperature, 
service of line and branch, date of proposed in-service weld, the reasons for in-service weld, and any alternatives. Engineering will determine if it's feasible to perform the in-service welding. They will review connection design and calculations of acceptable wall thicknesses and regulatory or code compliance requirements. They will also provide detailed written procedures, including maximum minimum flow rates and pressure that must be maintained on equipment during the task. When work is ready to begin, the supervisor or designated alternate should mark the exact location of the in-service weld on the affected pipe or equipment. The location for adequate connection and machine clearances needs to be checked as well. Safe exit from the area in case of an emergency should also be considered. When work is ready to begin, the facility engineer should mark the exact location of the in-service weld on the affected pipe or equipment, as well as check the location for adequate connection and machine clearances. Safe exit from the area in case of an emergency should also be considered. As the job progresses, a dye penetrant, radiography, or magnetic particle should be used to inspect the weld for underbead cracking. This must be done as a minimum after the first and final weld passes. The welder should clean foreign material or residues from the weld area after each weld inspection. Do not attempt in-service welding under any of the following conditions. If pressurized lines have a zero flow rate, in Alaska there are certain exceptions to this guideline. If air lines or piping have contained compressed air from lubricated compressors, when heated by welding, an internal film of oil could combine with available oxygen and explode. If piping is clad or lined. If vacuum systems contain flammable or combustible material when oxygen content upstream of the weld is 5% or more. If the external or internal surface has defects such as pitting, laminations, bulges, and so on. Or if the line contains more than 21% oxygen. A variance is required before in-service welding may be performed on any pipes with less than one quarter inch wall thickness. An immediate toxic risk may result from welding in the presence of acetylene, thylene, acids, propylene, or other hazardous or toxic materials that are prone to decomposition when exposed to the heat of welding. Therefore, these conditions should also be avoided. Welding on lines containing hydrogen sulfide or sour environments should be done only in emergency situations. Open-ended vapor flare or vent lines require continuous flow during in-service welding. Remember, the oxygen concentration in the line must be less than 5%. Also, be sure that all operating areas tied into the flare system are aware of the welding operation. When preparing for in-service welding, do not assume equipment is in new condition. Measurements must be taken to ensure that proper wall thickness exists for in-service welding to be done safely. Also, avoid in-service welding closer than 18 inches to a flange or threaded junction or within 3 inches of a welded seam. When welding on a tank, be sure the liquid level is at least 3 feet above the welding area. Never pump into or out of a tank while hot work is in progress. And all liquid lines should be properly isolated. Hot tapping is another procedure that has a limited but important use. It's a technique for attaching a branch connection to in-service piping by drilling through a previously attached welded connection and valve. Precautions for hot tapping include those we covered for in-service welding and general hot work. A separate permit is also required for each hot tap, even when done outside a classified area. The attachment weld, 
must be hydro tested before the permit can be issued. Engineering must provide a hot tap calculation sheet that includes branch line specifications, tap machine specifications, attachment and adapter dimensions, cutter travel, pressure and temperature limitations, and sketches of the proposed installation. Only qualified personnel may install and operate hot tapping equipment, and a pre-job safety meeting must be conducted with all personnel involved in making the hot tap. The nameplate on the tapping machine should be checked for rating, temperature, pressure, service, and so on. The tapping procedure should not start if any of the parameters listed on the plate may be exceeded during the job, and the hot tap machine must be pressure tested before using it. Also, do not continue if the line to be tapped contains more than 21% oxygen. The hot tap valve, adapter, and hot tap machine should be installed using information from the calculation sheet. The hot tap machine operator should confirm that the cutter does not jam or drag by running the boring bar in and out of the valve openings. Generally, a drill should be used for branch pipes up to two inches. Above two inches, a hole cutter that provides positive removal of the coupon is the proper tool. The movement of the drill or cutter should be observed to ensure that the tap can be completed within the dimensions of the pipe and hot tap unit. The cut must stop before the cutter contacts the opposite side of the pipe, and the cutter must be retractable far enough to close the tapping valve. The hot tap machine should be inspected to ensure that the bleed off valve will hold pressure and is not plugged. Bolts packing and packing nuts must be tight. The newly welded attachment, hot tap valve, and hot tapping machine should be simultaneously pressure tested before cutting or boring the coupon using one and a half times operating line pressure. When hydro testing lines operating above 200 degrees Fahrenheit, a fluid with a high boiling temperature should be used. Precautions are needed to avoid excessive pressure due to expansion of the heated fluid. Under cold conditions, low freezing point fluids such as glycol or methanol may be required. When tapping a small diameter pipeline, great caution must be used to prevent drilling through the other side of the pipe. Filters, strainers, or screens should be in place to protect downstream rotating equipment or automatic control valves from cuttings. When the operation is finished, the coupon and cuttings need to be removed. Notify the operations supervisor immediately if the coupon is lost or cannot be retrieved. And that basically covers the key points of hot tapping safely. This concludes our module on hot work. We've covered specific requirements for performing hot work in classified areas, in-service welding, and hot tapping. You can accomplish these tasks safely by taking responsibility for applying these procedures. Take care. I'll see you next time.